presidential commission released a report today on exploration of the moon, Mars, and the solar system. This is one hour. Are we ready? Did everyone see the handsome movie stars and starlets in this? <laughs> Good afternoon. I am Pete Aldridge. I am the chairman of the President's Commission on the Implementation of the United States Space Exploration Policy. The President announced the new vision for space exploration on January 14th, the year 2004. On January 27th, he signed an executive order establishing the commission to provide him advice on how to implement his new vision on space exploration and gave us a grand total of 120 days to complete our work. The members of the commission are with me today as well as the administrator of NASA. Sean, glad to see you. Welcome. Uh, let me introduce the commissioners. I'm just going to introduce them by name because in the report, which you all now have, uh, there's a short bio of each one of them and you can read for yourself. There's Michael Jackson, Laurie Leshen, Les Lyles, Paul Spudis, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and Maria Zuber. We had two other commissioners, Carly Fiorina uh, and Bob Walker, could not join us today. Uh, the Commission has completed its work on time, and we provided a report to the Vice President uh, at 11 a.m. this morning. Our work fell under the Federal Advisory Committee Act, which meant that uh, most of our deliberations occurred in public. The Commission held five televised public here meetings in Washington, in Dayton, in, San in Atlanta, in San Francisco, and New York City. We heard formal statements from 96 witnesses, and we had 38 informal state statements from private citizens who were among the audience. And we received over 6,000 inputs on our website of ideas and, and suggestions. The Commission unanimously supports the President's new vision for space, and the report has presented eight findings and 14 recommendations on how to implement the vision for success. While discovery is the goal of space, uh, space exploration, the Commission believes strongly that the journey is at least as important as the destination, as you heard from the film. The Commission also believes this journey and the space agenda advanced by the President are vital to the nation's technological leadership, economic vitality, and security. The rationale for our space program should be based on three concepts. First, exploration, the quest for knowledge, a symbol of American leadership, and the inspiration of, a, of the vision on our youth and teachers. Second, growth, the economic well-being of our nation, the creation, creation of technical jobs, the competitiveness of our nation's industrial base, and prosperity for the American people. And third, security, the physical, economic, and military security provided by an advanced technology and a skilled industrial base and workforce. We identified three imperatives for success, sustainability, affordability, and credibility. Our report identifies how we can achieve these imperatives. Our findings and recommendations cover the following subjects. This effort must be managed as a national priority, and we have proposed that the President establish a permanent multi-agency space exploration steering council reporting to the president. We're proposing a larger role for the private sector where NASA focuses on the higher risk space exploration mission and the private sector takes on much of the lower risk operational services such as access to low earth orbit. In this regard we're recommended that we create incentives for the development of a robust space industry which would become what we call a national treasure. We support a go-as-you-can-pay approach for funding, which allows specific exploration goals to be adjusted as technology advances and periodic milestones are achieved. This also allows the space exploration program to remain affordable within the resources available. We do not believe that an assessment of the mission and its affordability should be based on an unknowable and highly uncertain projection of total mission cost. We have proposed that NASA transform its organization and management processes to become more integrated and aligned with the new vision 
and to adopt the best management practices associated with large, complex system of systems. Such practices include spiral development, the use of system integrators, and independent technical and cost estimating advice. We are encouraged by NASA's first steps in this regard. We've also proposed strategies for conducting NASA's scientific agenda and recommended that elements of the mission should be international by design and we, pro we have proposed a model for international participation. We have recommended that the NASA centers become federally funded research and development centers to revitalize innovation, to work effectively with the private sector, and to stimulate local economic development. The operation of, of FFRDCs permits more flexible personnel systems and compensation. We have identified some enabling technologies that will be critical to achieve the exploration objectives within reasonable schedules and affordable cost. We've recommended the establishment of special project teams to ensure successful development for each of these technologies. We've recommended that the Congress increase the incentives for private sector investment in space and increase significantly monetary prizes to accelerate technology achievement, especially in the enabling technologies. The Commission strongly supports the, the Centennial Challenge Program recently established by NASA and suggests that it might be expanded to attract more entrepreneurs and private sector investment. We believe that the space exploration vision is enabled by prior scientific achievement and will be enabling for more science as we get access to the Moon, Mars, and other celestial bodies. And finally, we offered recommendations on how we can use this extraordinary opportunity with the announcement of the vision to stimulate math, science, and engineering education for students and teachers. In addition to better integration of current educational initiatives and a higher priority uh, on the science teachers, we are suggesting the development of a new virtual space academy for training the next generation of technical work, the technical workforce. Education should be on the agenda of the new Space Exploration Steering Council. And let me conclude with the following points. The Commission supports space exploration as, go as the goal of America's space program. Yes, it will be difficult, there will be risk, and we must anticipate some failures. But this is a great opportunity for our nation to inspire our youth and teachers toward math, science, and engineering education, to technologically innovate, building a space industry and a skilled industrial base, and improving the prosperity and quality of life for all Americans, and three, to discover new opportunities to gain knowledge of ourselves and our future. Thus, the title of our report, A Journey to Inspire, Innovate, and Discover. Uh, thank you very much, and I will open it up for questions. Any, any comments from the commissioners first? Okay. Susan, questions no? from the uh, Brian? Um, wondering if what you're talking about here really is turning over space station resupply um, to the private sector, or are you talking about transforming the way that NASA contracts for launch services? It would be a little bit of, of each. Uh, there's still a lot of gov government involvement in the uh, in the launch business, and so if, if what we're trying to get to is is to have NASA focus on the, those things which are inherently governmental. Uh, in our report, you'll note that the, probably the uh, human spaceflight part of the NASA mission pr probably can't be turned over to the, to the private sector, but the unmanned cargo-like processes could be. And let's not stop there. It, there are other things that the private sector can do beyond just the launch business. So we believe that if, if NASA can focus on those very difficult, high-risk, clearly not money-making missions, and look for things that the private sector can do in helping NASA focus its attention on the, on, the, on the real exploration stuff and take NASA's attention off the more operational, mundane things and give it over to the private sector, which uh, hopefully can be profitable and, and, 
and stimulate their, uh, their investment in that area. That's what we're talking about, and that's what we w we'd like to do. There are a lot of details to be worked out. This is not going to be easy, but we, we believe this is the right direction for us to go. Pete, can I add two yeah, things to that? Please. The snapshot of what's possible today will look different five years, 10 years, 20 years from now. And so what we're saying about this <coughs> issue is you have to be nimble and iterative. That You have to understand that what the private sector can do for the vision today will be different five years, 10 years from now. And NASA has to be nimble and, and take that on in that way. And, and second, uh, it's not just about contracting out. It's about engaging the, the intellectual creativity and the, the unique skill sets of, of, of the world's uh, uh, private sector to help make this mission a success. And they will find different things to bring to the table uh, for NASA, for the vision, uh, than NASA might be able to think of on their own. And that, that creativity is, is natural and, and important and, uh, and, and will change over time. So what NASA does today will be different as the mission emerges over time. Okay, Mark, uh, would you identify yourself in your publication, please? Uh, Mark Caro from the Houston Chronicle, and mine's for Secretary Aldridge. I want to get some sense of how quickly uh, some of the underlying and very fundamental, almost profound changes within the within NASA itself and the administration and the way they deal with each other and the rest of the country need to be made. Uh, the exploration agenda is is uh, is uh, go as you pay. But this part seems rather fundamental. Before you can get to that part, these changes have to be made. And how quickly do you think that needs to be done? We're recommending certainly of, of the 14 recommendations, some can be done right away. Uh, certainly the creation of the Space Exploration Steering Council can be made today. The President signs an executive order and it's done. Uh, some of the organizational changes are, are already in the process within NASA, and that doesn't take very long to change the organization chart, and, and we support that and applaud it because the, I think the direction the NASA is going in creating a, a new organization, now that there is a clear-cut mission to be performed and a direction to be performed, that can happen relatively quickly. Changing the cultural nature of people, it will take a little longer time, but that's what we're proposing to do, that this is a, this is a tremendous thing for NASA. For years, the, they, they, didn't, they didn't have a direction that has been clearly articulated by the president now. And it's got to be multiple presidents. This has got to last through 10 presidential terms at least. And so it's not a, it is nonpartisan, as my good friend Neil uh, Tyson has said several times. And, and it's got to be sustainable over a long period of time. So an organizational change in NASA to get itself focused on the mission, a change in the national leadership that's directed, and a change in, in culture that uh, how we address the private sector, how we address the operations of the centers to make them more, uh, more private sector-like, clearly recognizing that's, that there has to be inherently government functions performed at those centers. But a lot of the technical work could be shifted to the FFRDC. That's going to take a little longer time to figure out exactly how to do that. It's going to be hard. It's going to take require people to, to change, and that is always very, very difficult. But I think the philosophy that we're heading toward of, of a space industry, a, uh, a highly technical, skilled workforce, uh, a NASA focused on the, the real long-term exploration goals is the right thing for us to be heading toward. And it's going to be hard to get there. We recognize that. But it's, that's the right direction. Things that are good are hard, but that's okay. If I could add, uh, even though we came to our recommendations and findings obviously very independently, we were very heartened to see that a lot of the management activities and management and organizational recommendations were things that are already underway in some form or another at, at NASA headquarters. Uh, the things that uh, Sean O'Keefe is already doing relative to one NASA very much fits with our recommendation for an integrated organization uh, that's all on the same page, if you will, relative to the goals and the vision. Uh, the organizational construct of putting authorities and responsibilities under one single hat. It's very much in line with the creation of Code T, uh, the Exploration Systems Organization led by Rear Admiral Craig Steidel. So uh, our recommendations, again, we found to be very much in sync 
with the movement and activities that are currently underway. So we think those fundamental changes uh, can be done very, very quickly. While uh, taking time to do things like FFRDCs and, and some of the other recommendations, we're very, very happy to see the path that NASA is already on. Is the initial budget uh, enough, and will we see with the reallocation of funds um, programs like uh, the Mars Rovers or the uh, Cassini Project or um, Stardust, those types of programs losing money and uh, being turned over to the MAN program? If the Congress passes the request of the NASA budget, there will be enough money to begin this project. Uh, I, 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 um, let me draw, underline that. It, if the Congress passes the, the resources, we have to get the shuttle back flying in, and we need to get on with the engineering activities that will turn this vision into an engineering model that we can actually get the contractors starting to address in a, in a realistic way. Those are essential. So the, the NASA budget has to be passed at the levels that have been requested. And if that is done, then we can get on with this project. The, act, the, the budgets that are projected beyond that are very, very modest. It's less than seven-tenths of one percent of the federal budget. That has been close to a historical number for NASA. It's always been very low. Most, most people don't realize that the NASA budget is that small. They, a lot of people believe that it's the size of the Department of Defense. It's nowhere close to that. But it's less, you know, it's less than one percent of the federal budget. And we c accomplish a lot for that small amount of money. If we can get that kind of level of funding for the next 20 years, we believe with the right allocation of the, of the activities, such as uh, phasing out the shuttle at the appropriate time and focusing our attention on this new mission, that it can be done within that which we believe to be affordable within this nation. Pete, the other part of that question is, do we have to sacrifice these exciting <coughs> scientific uh, missions that we have uh, seen? And the answer to that is a straightforward no. This is a discovery-driven agenda that can accommodate a wide diversity of scientific missions, and we're going to learn from those missions and grow with those missions and incorporate them integrally into the program throughout. We were, a lot of people have asked us, you know, well, how much is this going to cost? And the answer to it, I don't know. I'll ask you the same question. How much is the cure for cancer going to cost? I don't know that either. But I know what I can afford on an annual basis to try to get there. And this is the same model that we're using for the space program. It's how much can we afford on an annual basis, and we'll allow that to determine when we can accomplish these missions. Within the budgets that have been projected, we believe that the president has laid out a time scale, a timetable for these things, and it can, we can achieve those within the budgets that have been projected. But it is really impossible for you, us to project what is this mission going to cost in the year 2020. We don't even know what the technologies we're going to be applying to that are going to be, so it's impossible to cost, and it's highly uncertain, and it's probably a mistake to try to do so. I'd like to add that, um, as we say in mathematics, there's an existence proof for the funding level that NASA already uh, receives, not as a percent of the federal budget, but in terms of, uh, if you forward value the history of NASA's budget to, say, $2,004, and then ask, throughout the 1960s, how much did NASA receive? They received about $170 billion over that 10-year period. And you divide that per year, it's about $17 billion a year. Well, lately, NASA's been getting $15, $16 billion a year. And so over the 1960s, we went through uh, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, planned Skylab. And so we know we can do great things at that budget level. We're not just pulling this out of the ether. Uh, and hoping that something can happen. But we recognize that the, the sort of uh, the, the, the legacy structures that prevail from that era are not the kinds of structures that will allow this vision to go forward, and hence the uh, extensive discussion and report about how to organize for that. Uh, but there's a point that you did mention that we didn't, haven't yet addressed, whether there's money that would be eaten by a manned program versus the robotic program. Uh, we are very clear and strong about the joint role that both would play. Uh, you would do one when it's sensible and another or both in combination, but these are priorities that would be set by scientific 
goals and objectives um, and exploration objectives. So uh, there's always a fear that all the money goes to send an astronaut and there's no science that will have take place. Um, we were not insensitive to that concern, and that's addressed in the report. Somewhere at one of our hearings, there was somebody who made a comment about, can you imagine the picture back from Mars where there's a human and a robot doing a high five? <laughs> And I think that that was a perfect <laughs> illustration of, of clearly what we're looking for. It's a balance, it's a mixture, it's an integration of robotic and human spaceflight. I'd so like to take a question from the phone bridge now. Marsha Dunn? Maybe we won't be taking a question from the phone bridge. Hello, can you uh, hear me? Marsha, yes, we can hear you fine. Uh, yes, I have a question for Mr. Aldridge. I'm wondering if you've spoken since the report was finished to the president, what his uh, reaction was to this, and uh, or what the vice president's reaction is for this, and whether they plan to start talking up things a little more. We met with the uh, vice president this morning at 11 o'clock uh, in the White House, the West Wing. Uh, I presented him a copy of the report uh, and gave him a summary of it. Uh, I would. Uh, classify, uh, describe the reaction as positive. Uh, uh, obviously, they have not read the report as yet, but uh, I would think it's, it's positive, and, and uh, I think there will be some actions as a result of this report uh, coming out. I know that, as I had already mentioned, that some organizational changes are already in, 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 the, in the process, uh, and we will see, uh, you know, as the next few weeks Pan out, pan out. How, uh, how, what is the reaction going to be? All right, we have a mic down here, please. I'm Amy Butler with Defense Daily. Um, I have a question specifically about the security aspect. The report mentioned that this exploration would help to enhance security as well as technology and other things, um, but it focuses on the threat of asteroids. Is there any other benefit that um, perhaps defense programs can gain from these programs that, that you're pushing now? And would it help accelerate or enhance any defense department programs that are now underway, like missile defense, for example? Uh, this is going to be a two-way street, uh, not just one way. If we begin to develop these enabling technologies uh, for the space exploration program, it has to contribute to a stronger technical base that exists in the United States. And whether that technical base is applied to space or the medical field or other types of technology areas or the Department of Defense, it's got to be valuable. So building a strong technical base resulting from uh, an inspiration of, uh, for the students and teachers in science, math, and engineering has got to be important for the national security because of this tech base. On the other hand, the Department of Defense spends an enormous amount of money in technology that is also equally applicable to the NASA space program. I'm particularly uh, familiar with the work going on within the Air Force Research Lab and the Defense Advanced Research Project Agencies, many high-risk, high-technology things that NASA can, can use without having to duplicate the resources and the, and the effort for those purposes. So I really clearly see it as a two-way street, both in the, the national security area of that technology base, helping national security, and the technology base that exists within the Department of Defense, helping NASA. And that's something that we, we did talk about. In fact, we talked about enhancing the, the Partnership Council that currently exists and the Space Technology Alliance, which also currently exists, but we, need, we believe they need to be enhanced now that we have a really good direction and mission for NASA. How can you contribute specifically to that, that mission? Amy, one, one test of this is uh, when we went out and had our various hearings and went around to the various centers, we asked a question of the centers, the NASA centers, uh, what are the key enabling technologies to accomplish this mission? And they gave us their list of recommendations. We asked the same question of the Air Force Research Laboratory about their DOD, defense space programs. 
when you look at the two lists, you see complete agreement in terms of the basic technologies that have to be addressed, enabling technologies for both sets of different uh, missions. And uh, that just gave proof to us that there's an opportunity here to leverage the activities, leverage the resources, leverage the intellectual capital between the two agencies to help address th things that can solve uh, problems for both sides. All right, we'll take another phone bridge. Graham Warwick, are you on? How about CNN? Okay, we'll phone went dead. <laughs> phones went dead, yes. In the front row with the green tie. Oh, oh, oh. Back. There we go. Uh, Earl Lane with Newsday. Uh, I was wondering, on the, back on the science question for just a minute, um, if I'm a research scientist with a, a specialty, specialty in gamma ray bursts or black holes, should I be more nervous about getting future missions uh, and programs than if I'm a planetary surfaces specialist? Can, can I address that? No, I think you should be excited because I think you have a whole new range of potential opportunities for missions and observations that you never would have had otherwise. Fundamentally, I think that we believe the vision is about creating new capability. And anytime we have new capability created, we get opportunities, some of which we can't even imagine right now. So naturally, when, you're, when you've got an agency with, it, with a limited budget, you can't do everything. But on the other hand, if you create the ability to open up new windows or new ways of doing business, uh, it can't help but advance science. And we firmly believe that, that the vision is, is, is very encouraging and, and is structured such that we'll have many more opportunities in the future than we have now. All right. Yeah, <coughs> Kern and Chase, I'm with Forecast International. Uh, you talk about the role industry will be playing uh, do you see any major changes needed in industry? For example, uh, through consolidation, you have fewer, larger com companies. Uh, do you see that trend being positive? Do they need to make some other adaptations to accomplish what is, uh, you're asking for? Uh, what do you see? Well, let me start, and maybe I'll turn it over to uh, some of the other commissioners. Uh, there probably will be some more consolidations. I don't think we we probably have got to, to the limit of big consolidations at this point in time. Um, but I really, I think industry needs to step up and be innovative in this particular vision and, and to suggest how they might do things differently, maybe thinking out of the box, having new ideas, uh, having those ideas flow into NASA. And I... And I, I, you've kind of focused on the big businesses. I would, I would focus on all businesses because I think there's a role for entrepreneurs in this new vision. I think there's a, ro a strong role for small business because small businesses are usually very innovative. They're very quick. Uh, they have great ideas, but they don't have the resources to get these ideas flowing. And I think uh, one of the areas we talked about in, in the uh, – in our report is a role of a, of a system integrator, which DOD and NASA have all been, they've dealt with system integrator roles, where the system integrator can solicit ideas from the small businesses. We also talk about international participation. The international industrial base can contribute to this mission if, if in, done in the right way. So th there's big business roles, there's small business roles, there's in entrepreneurial roles that can contribute to technology leadership. Uh, I think there's a there's a role for everyone, and I don't think there really requires any change, but there re does require the motivation to go after it, and perhaps that's what we need, the motivation to, to, okay, now we've got the vision, how can we specifically contribute to it? That's probably something new. I, I'd like uh, to add, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. sorry, uh, I, I'd served with uh, our fellow commissioner here, Bob Walker, on the Aerospace Commission, a report released now two years ago, and I think one of the most disturbing plots in that report was the, the diagram that demonstrated from 20 years ago the number of distinct aerospace companies that through consolidation or bankruptcy or what have you have whittled down to just a handful 15 years later. And what disturbed us most about that, of course, is the concern about the loss of innovation that such consolidation 
sometimes brings with it. And I'd like to see the next, I, I see this vision as bringing on the age of the entrepreneur where you um, stimulate the creativity of people who are not necessarily those in your traditional business sectors, uh, where I it, it, think of it as the, the, uh, a corresponding period of time that I can think of is the birth of the, of the personal computer, where people were doing things in their garage that ultimately became uh, multinational uh, billion dollar corporations. And so uh, the idea that the individual can have, an, um, can have a, uh, a fresh discovery that has access to where that discovery matters is what will uh, form a major profile of this vision going forward. Mike, you want to comment? Yeah, I, I would just say one thing. This question is a good question because it allows us to unpack a very precious part of what exists at the core of this commission's uh, recommendations. It's this. We're not about trying to provide wiring diagrams about how to do this large and ambitious vision. We're about trying to tell you the performance outcomes, the, uh, the management structures and tools, the, uh, the organizational uh, assets that you need to get it done. So we don't really have an opinion about whether there ought to be more or less uh, integration of, of corporations. What we're saying is if we do the right type of procurements, if we have the right culture, if we have the right organization, if we take the right approach to doing this new task and audacious uh, 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 you know, commitment to it, then the private sector will figure those things out. That's not a government function, and we, uh, we have steered away from that type of uh, speculative work. My name is Dave Schleck. I cover NASA Langley Research Center for the Daily Press, and I'm already thinking about how my job would change if uh, the center turned into went through the transformation of going to a, a FFRDC. But uh, I wanted to ask, did you all look at whether all 10 centers are needed in order to accomplish uh, NASA's vision, and um, did you look at the role uh, aeronautics would play? The answer is, the, is yes to both of those. Um, we thought about it a long time, and I, our view of it was if we put into our report that the Congress and NASA should undertake a base realignment and closure action, the report would probably have been burned on the first day. Um, that, it was just, that was too hard to do, but we said to ourselves, there's another model that says let the private sector determine the value and function and history and future of the of the of these centers and turning them into the federally funded research and development centers allows the centers to not only serve the interest of NASA using compensation which c is competitive with the private sector using personnel uh, processes which are comparable with the private sector so they can mix the skills over periods of time according to the need and to do functions in support of the lo local community outside of the work for NASA. Because FFRDCs can, in fact, do outside work so long as it contributes to the, uh, the, uh, the independence and objectivity of the work for NASA. So the, s the centers could, in fact, take on more of a private sector role still serving the interests of NASA but allowing their skills to be marketed outside and develop their own skill base and their own market potential. And yet, that potential is still available to NASA because if they start working outside, and we know the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, for example, does outside work. It allows the staff to be larger to support that work, but that total staff is available to NASA on an as-needed basis and it, it, it just permits a more flexible, long-term structure for the centers that can perhaps make them stronger and contribute better to the economic, the local economic uh, value. So rather than attacking a BRAC, let's put the structure in for the centers that allow them to determine their own future based upon their own skills. I just want to say that we, we visited many NASA centers during the course of our activities and deliberations, a subset of this group went around to quite a few of them. And the people who work at the NASA centers are extraordinary and the skill sets that are there are uh, phenomenal and they have taken us to 
to this great place that we stand on the precipice of being able to go out and do this fantastic mission. So we all came away ex extraordinarily impressed with what we saw at the NASA centers. What we saw though also was a need to think about how they could be more nimble and be able to be responsive on these five and 10 year time scales to what are gonna be changing needs and new opportunities. And so we saw this as a good way to help provide uh, a way that the centers can really be responsive to implementing the vision as time goes on. And we, we think it's a, a great idea. Let me address the other part of your question, the aeronautics. Yes, we, uh, as, as this new vision has now been defined, uh, there are some things perhaps that NASA doesn't need to do within its current organization and they have already started that process with the transfer of the expendable launch vehicles to DOD and some adjustments in the funding, a plan to phase out the shuttle at a period of time. Uh, all those are already part of the reallocation of NASA to meet this, this new area. We did look at the aeronautics and said, well, is there a long-term role of aeronautics? We also looked at earth sciences as another type of thing. Is, is this something that contributes? Right now, we see as there are some synergies between the aeronautics and the earth sciences. Earth sciences obviously related to planetary sciences, which are part of the vision. And you gotta exit and you gotta re-enter the atmosphere and other atmospheres. And so there's an aeronautics part there. And so the question is, well, if you transferred it to some other agency, is another agency able to do that job better or cheaper than NASA? And the answer, and, and, and yet still recognize the synergy that exists within the function of the NASA, and the answer was, that doesn't appear to be the right thing to do. However, we did say that NASA, on a periodic basis, needs to reevaluate, I don't know if you call it zero-based budgeting, I know Sean understands what that means, <laughs> Uh, every year or every two years about what is NASA doing and is it still contributing to the fundamentals of this mission and if it's not, transfer it or do something else. But that has to be continually evaluated based upon what we now know is a clear mission for NASA and all the functions of NASA have to be contributing to that. And, and so right now we didn't see the value of doing it but it doesn't mean that someday in the future there may be a different decision, and that's up to what NASA has to do. Is there anyone on the phone bridge? Yes. Do you, would you like to identify yourself and ask your question, please? Sure. Uh, that's Michael Farn of CNN.com. Uh, one of my questions was, what is emphasis placed on transferring uh, launch operations and more routine uh, responsibilities that NASA handles to the private sector? Is there room in the space vision uh, and NASA's mission for a private human space shuttle? Well, I, I think from the commission's charter, that was something that we, we did not address. Although I, I think from the point of view of private sector involvement, creating a space industry, that would fall into a a category that perhaps uh, we would consider in a, in a favorable way, but we did not actually address that question head on. So. But, but in, in, a, in an indirect way, I think we have, we have acknowledged that uh, ideas like space tourism and low Earth orbit uh, contribute to the innovation cycle and the, the, the national base of industrial skills that are necessary uh, for advancing the vision itself. So there's certainly a broad swath of opportunity for uh, the private sector to explore as they are, are so motivated to do. All right, up here in the pink jacket. Hi, uh, Gwyneth Shaw with the Orlando Sentinel. Um, you say in the report that without the full support of the administration and Congress that this vision will be stillborn. Um, but there doesn't seem to be a lot in the report to sort of, um, th that's aimed at shaping the debate in Congress right now. I'm just curious if there are particular things that you think um, Congress really needs to listen to from this report and how you think it may change the debate up on the Hill. Well, I think the, uh, the debate on the Hill is, is fo first focused on getting the Congress to agree that this is the right vision for us to head toward and to uh, get the Congress to agree that uh, this go as you can pay approach is the right approach and not keep demanding uh, estimates of what it's going to cost when we, we can't make those estimates at this point in time. So I think agreement on the direction, agreement on the funding approach, 
an agreement to fund the NASA budget to this relatively small uh, amount of federal funding is, is, is essential. There, there's another piece of this, though, as, it, as, I, as we did point out in the report, the sustainability issue is, is very critical, that the American people have to achieve ownership of this. Uh, and they have to be shown the value of the space program to their, their way of life. And that so that the American people are going to vote for those who share those same values every year for the next 40, 50 years. And so the, 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 the hope that I would have is that the Congress would accept that this is the right way to go. We, it's affordable within the resources that we know are available. And that... Um, uh, and and they trust NASA to perform this mission with credibility, that they have the organization in place to make it happen. Uh, they have the processes in place to make it happen. Uh, and I, th I think our report does, in fact, say all those things. Yeah, Pete, if I could just add to that. Um, the, one of the things that the report focused on and that the commission spent a great deal of time talking about is why do you want to do this to begin with? You know, should the nation have a space program, should this nation have a robotic space pro program and a human space program. <clears throat> and, uh, and we actually spent a great deal of time in the report talking about that to kind of raise that argument. And, uh, and so I, you know, I honestly believe and I think that the Commission believed on the, the basis of a number of discussions that this, uh, this discussion from a congressional point of view has to be that this is not something just for congressional districts that happen to have NASA centers in them. Uh, we're talking here about American leadership. Uh, we're talking here about education and the fact that we need to have a, a greater base of technical training within our education system. And we're talking here about jobs and good technical jobs uh, remaining in this country. And, uh, and I think that's relevant to every congressional district in this country. I, I think not only that, there was some legacy thinking about, uh, well, what will this vision cost? And that's the kind of question you'd ask in the Apollo era. We want to go to the moon, what does that cost? And it's quite understandable. Um, so, some of the, some of the uh, challenging questions we received from Congress have simply been because their, the wiring of their thinking is from another era where they see NASA as coming up with a place to go and costing that out and then going. Uh, one of the uh, problems with that plan, if you want to turn the whole solar system into your backyard, is that to pick a place and go there, you get there and say, okay, what do we do next? Well, that's what happened with the moon. We got there, you look around, there was nothing in place to go beyond the moon to turn the rest of the solar system into your backyard. And so, you have to ask a different kinds of funding questions and different kinds of planning questions and implementation questions for this vision than had been happened before. All right, here in the front. Randy Shostak, reporter with EOS, the newspaper of the American Geophysical Union. Could you elaborate on how does the Earth Science Division in, in NASA fit in um, with this new vision, what kind of budget uh, cuts, retooling, et cetera, it might face, and uh, what do you see as the future of Earth sciences within NASA? Yeah, let, me, let me start out with that one. Um, we talked a lot about, uh, we, we actually talked a lot about Earth science, and we talked about science in general, and I think if you read the report, um, what you will see is, uh, is that the commission collectively came out very, very strongly in terms of basic science. And, um, and with the idea that what we want to do is create the capability to get into space and do things, and that enables one to do a whole range of scientific things, the kind of scientific things that have been planned for decades, plus many, many scientific things that can't even be imagined right now because nobody really thought about what could happen if humans and robots could work together synergistically in space. For the specific uh, role of Earth sciences, uh, the Commission agreed that the nation uh, should have a strong Earth Science program. And we laid out within, uh, within the report uh, a range of scientific questions that one could propose as a sort of a notional research agenda 
although the specific research agenda would have to be uh, determined by the science community. In fact, that was one of our recommendations, that the science community really needs to get together and to go back and to think about uh, how they might modify what their near-term goals are to be consistent with what this exploration vision is. Um, so we did, uh, you know, we did talk about the ideas of climate change. We did talk about the ideas of natural hazards. Um, but we did also say um, that there could be some very highly regarded science programs uh, that could potentially uh, not fit in with the focus of the vision, okay? And that is to say that these, pro th that is not to say that these programs uh, shouldn't be done. Uh, this is to say that they don't fit in the sort of technological direction of where the, the vision uh, is headed. In those cases, uh, we recommended that these important programs uh, go to another government agency that can do them justice uh, along with their budgets. Um, and so, uh, so we are very strongly uh, in favor of important, highly regarded science programs getting done. We think that there's a lot of opportunities for these to be done during the, to be accomplished uh, as part of the vision. And those that aren't fitting within the vision uh, should find a new home. Uh, where they can be accomplished. Okay, we'll take. Uh, stay over here. Here, over here. Use your ah, voice. very good. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. No, no. You right there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm Larry Wheeler with Gannett News Service. I was wondering if you could put your work product in context um, with the thought of one of the most recent reports that many in the space media uh, received was the Columbia Accident Investigation Board report taken very seriously by NASA, almost to the point that it, uh, it's taken on the status of an 11th commandment, and rightfully so, a very serious report with some specific recommendations. Do you think your work product is going to be treated in that vein? <laughs> you might have to ask the, uh, the president, the vice president, and, may, and maybe the administrator of NASA that question. Uh, I will say if, if this vision is serious, which we believe it is, then the recommendations of this report are critical in the successful implementation of that vision. We were set out to do that. Our committee, the commission was called the Commission on Implementation. We laid out a, 14, a series of 14 recommendations that we believe all unanimously are required to make that vision a success. Will it be successful without the recommendations? Maybe but it is uh, more likely to be successful if these recommendations are implemented than otherwise. Uh, I'd like to add that these implementation, this implementation plan is not simply how do you reorganize NASA. It contains recipes for bringing the public along with the vision so that, to reiterate a point, the public takes ownership of the vision. Uh, in the same way, uh, just doesn't take much reminding to think back just a few months ago when you know the news had come out that we maybe not be able to service the Hubble telescope and you just look at the public reaction to that that told me that NASA didn't own Hubble not even did the scientists own Hubble the public owned Hubble and that was an extraordinary revelation for me to realize that the public can feel so strongly about science and a scientific instrument that they would put pressure on, on their lawmakers to try to do something about it. It's that kind of ownership that I look forward to seeing in the public as we go forward. Because the day that happens, um, as we'd already noted, it no longer becomes a political issue. It's neither partisan nor bipartisan, it is nonpartisan. And it becomes part of our culture, part of our nation's, um, what, it, what it means to be American and to think about the profile of what we do as Americans, it would become unimaginable to think of a time when we don't do it. And there then comes the, 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 the pressure from, quote, below rather than from up on high. And in some ways that's a much more powerful force to put into motion. Hi. Any one more question here.
Ryan Berger with Space News and Space.com for Secretary Aldridge again. Um, the commission elected not to recommend a BRAC, as you pointed out, recommended the FFRDCs instead. One can imagine resistance to this recommendation as well. How critical is this to the success of your implementation strategy? And even if it is achieved, does it solve the problem we sometimes have with field centers where the tail can wag the dog? Well, it, our commission thought it was critical if the skills needed uh, to be available to make this vision successful uh, are going to be achieved, that's the way to achieve it. And that's the way to develop a, uh, an industrial base that can really support NASA well. Uh, if it's not implemented, uh, I'm not sure disaster will occur, but it is certainly make it much more likely that the right skills and the right uh, capability exists within NASA to make the vision successful is going to require a change in, in the operation of the NASA centers. That was our recommendation, and we stick behind it, that this is really the right way to go. Uh, as I pointed out earlier, if none of the recommendations are, are achieved, is this vision not achievable? Well, it is less likely to be achievable unless we, we do implement all 14 recommendations. All right. I, anyone? I thank you all for coming today. We will, uh, commissioners will do one-on-ones at the conclu conclusion of our press conference here. Thank you very much. The September 11th Commission holds its final public hearings today. Military, NORAD, and Federal Aviation Administration officials will testify on the